Uh, we have two speakers today uh, on the webinar. We have uh, Andrew Drennan, who's a principal at HKA and head of a quantum and delay in our Scottish region. And we have Paul Ives, who is uh, an executive director based in the Northwest and also a quantum expert. And without further ado, I'll pass over to Andrew, who's going to uh, kick off our session this morning. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, yeah, so um, thanks for giving up your time this morning to, to listen to uh, Paul and myself. Um, hopefully it'll be quite informative. Um, we're going to essentially talk about claims, variations and records, which uh, I suppose a lot, of, a lot of us in the construction sector, um, we, we're probably facing a few issues in terms of uncertainty um, and, and almost uh, one of the key issues in, during the, these times is getting paid. Um, so we're going to look at a number of things. Sorry. Yeah, so we're going to look at a number of things uh, during the seminar. Um, I suppose in terms of a, an introduction, um, my background is, is pretty much I started my career in main contracting. Um, so apologies if, if some of the slides and, and comments uh, come from a slightly um, main contracting or, or subcontract bias, but, but certainly we'll, we'll try and assist um, everybody from um, certainly from any lawyers on the call and, and equally um, any employers. So we're going to talk about some of the key issues um, based on experiences so on claims and variations. Um, communication, which um, from a slant of, of some of the, the key contracts we, we, we have in construction sector. So we'll look at NEC3, FIDIC and JCT. So I'll look at these two sections. Um, with a bit of a, a advisory uh, theme, I suppose, in terms of how to communicate um, some of the issues we face in claims. Then as we, we move through, uh, Paul's going to talk about records and probably more importantly, how to present a claim. Um, Paul's got a lot of experience producing and uh, negotiating claims. Um, so he's going to talk, give, give a few pointers on how to, how to present a robust position. And then, um, as some of us may experience, what happens if the if the claim fails? What are the options open to us under ADR? So, is it mediation, uh, adjudication, or arbitration? So, Paul will talk about um, a few options. Um, as Suzanne said, um, the slides will be available for people who who wish to um, take a copy. And, and Paul and I's details are on, on this slide. Um, I certainly have no issue with, with people emailing questions directly, so uh, please feel free after the seminar to, to get in touch. So claims and variations, I think. Um, in terms of our, our, our work at HKA, um, probably about 50% of our, our work is uh, producing claims. Um, as well as assisting people defend claims. Um, the other half is, is expert work, so we, we do expert work um, in adjudication, arbitration and litigations. We're obviously acting as independent quantum delay and engineering experts, uh, as well as we've got um, forensic accountants. Um, so so that's, that's a big part of our business. But claims um, are equally important. Uh, I still do a bit of claims work myself. Um, so, so really, uh, what I want to identify is what are claims? So, so claims for me are essentially the exercise of entitlement. Um, I think claims are sometimes seen in our sector as a as a slightly bad or negative thing, um, where where if some a contractor or a subcontractor in particular, um, if they're claims conscious, it's seen as a negative, but I think it's it's basically a it's a mechanism um, to recover entitlement. Um, so I think certainly as a as a as a sector we want to get round 
the kind of adverse nature of claims. It's certainly, in my opinion, we need to we need to exercise entitlement under contracts. Equally, a claim can be to value or to, to claim additional value for things, or seek recompense for a loss suffered. So claims can be from any any of the parties. Um, so, as I said, my background is main contracting. So, as a main contractor, I may have a claim from uh, a subcontractor, but equally, as a main contractor, they may present claims to employers. Equally, employer and employer may submit a claim um, for defects down to a, a contractor. Um, so, so, claims can be from any of the parties traditionally involved in um, contracts. Um, usually, we find that claims can be the stage um, just before things potentially reach dispute stage. So, one of the things I wanted to identify um, as a business, um, HKA, um, now annually, annually we do a, a, an analysis of um, quite a significant number of projects around the globe. So last year, I think we looked at well over a thousand um, assignments we were involved in um, with quite a significant value. So I think the construction values were around about $3 trillion, in which we published um, Crux Insight, which people can look at the HK website and download their own copy. But essentially, the, the top five are plucked out there from, from Crux, which kind of rings through, in my experience, is, is why the claims and variations happen. Um, the number one in the list, you wouldn't be that surprised, is change in scope. So certainly from, from my experience, I think scope is um, sometimes during um, contract initiation or, or tendering, it's certainly something that people can tend to, to overlook. And what I try to do is I'll look at scope as being equally as important as, as cost and equally as important as, as a program. I think you've got to look at it as a, as a kind of three-pronged um, approach in terms of contracts. Um, so looking at the price, program, and scope is, is very, very important. Obviously, the scope being the, the, the basis for which the programs are derived and equally how um, people have generated prices. So if that scope changes, then ultimately, in a claim, naturally the prices may increase and the, the, the time changes. So changing the scope we find is, is the top issue. Um, contract requirements poorly drafted. Um, for those who are involved in, in some of the large infrastructure projects, you, you can see that um, there's been quite a high level of skill in preparing some of these contracts. But equally, as that flows down the supply chain from um, some contractors and some subcontractors, you may not get the same level of um, perhaps lawyer or, or expert input into, into contracts. So we find that contract drafting is one of the key areas. Um, contract management, administrative failures is equally um, one of the key issues. So um, when we talk through this seminar about communication, um, especially in terms of contract notification, that is one of the key the key things that we want to we want to look at. Um, I think especially those who deal with NEC contracts, um, administration is probably sometimes a, a bit of a burden for people. Um, our guys do a lot of work with with some of the teams in, in main contracting and, and employers trying to assist. Um, but certainly, I'd advise anybody involved in, in contract management of any contract to look at what the requirements are and indeed what, what resources are required to do that. Um, design, obviously a key part of um, the, the scoping document. Um, normally, what you'll find is that scope may be a, a kind of um, outline scope. We are, we are on a DNB especially. Um, that the design information would, would formalise that scope. So design um, 
is, is a key uh, delay that we, we find. And of course, probably more generally, the level of skill and, and experience uh, or the lack of it uh, is a key area for variations in claims. So some of the categories uh, of claims, um, for those, some, sometimes this is um, be quite general, but some of the key things we look at uh, in terms of claim production, um, naturally contractual claims, so potentially in the early stages of contracts, there's a difference or an ambiguity potentially between what the contract says and, and how another party interprets. Um, additional work claims, as I've said, uh, scope or change of scope is quite a key um, reason for those changes. And loss of productivity is key. Um, one of the things that uh, I've done a lot of work on recently is, is loss of productivity, especially during um, COVID-19. When we look at, well, what is the impact a particular event and how is that affected um, productivity. So I think if you look at one, one of the techniques that we, we can look at is um, perhaps a measured mile approach where what we're looking at is what was the productivity up to the start of COVID-19 for example, what was, the, what was the productivity up to the kind of middle of March um, and then what we do is analyse the period after the impact, so after the middle of March to perhaps where we are now, and, and essentially try and bridge the gap or, or provide um, the answers behind some of that loss of productivity. Now, I think currently we'd be looking at a lot of that loss of productivity is, is because sites have shut down or sites have been limited to uh, a reduced workforce, for example. So naturally, the loss of productivity would be quite um, quite simple to, to calculate. Um, but what I would say to you is if we're ever going to calculate loss of productivity, um, and, and Paul's going to touch on this, is records are vitally important for doing that. So what we can't have is that perhaps during uh, this unprecedented time that we've got um, naturally loss of productivity, but you need to still demonstrate where you were before and what you what you were doing during the period of that loss. Um, damages and extension of time are, are, are obviously linked to uh, time events, which are some of the categories that we'd look at. So naturally extensions of time where if there's a, a contract end date or a, or a period for completion or key key date, essentially um, the, the claimant is looking to recover an extension of time. Um, again, putting that in the perspective of where we are with COVID, I think um, some commentators will suggest that as a fourth major event, there will be an extension of time um, awarded, however, potentially not costs. So that really depends on the, the individual um, terms and conditions of the contract. So variations slightly different from claims. So in my view, variations are, are essentially a change to the baseline documents. So that would be probably more of a, a nailed on contractual way of recovering change. So I've outlined some of the changes that you might want to think about, what, what, are, the, what are the effects and what are the variations. So looking at changes in documents. So it might be works information and in NEC contracts, or it might be site information, for example. It might be simply a change to the drawing or specifications. Um, condition, conditions of contract may change, especially um, currently now, there may be changes in law that, that cope with um, the follow on from, from COVID, etc. how we work. Um, so, so these things are all, all key issues to look out for. Um, correspondence, key. So what is, uh, what is are, are all the parties to contract saying? What are they instructing? 
These are all key uh, variations. So dealing with variations, um, what I'm going to do in the, in the communications section, I'll touch on um, how different contracts handle communications and how we how we communicate and notify. Um, but dealing with variations, generally in JCT and NEC contracts, we've got relevant events and compensation events. Each contract is different, obviously. So, so some of the standard ones I've listed. Um, so we're looking at changes of scope, um, perhaps items of uh, historic va value or archaeology. Um, I know recently on High Speed Two there was quite a quite an interesting um, change where they they identify that a Bronze Age uh, murder actually. So I think you probably find in the press that these things will delayed uh, HS Two. Um, how, how we turn that into a valid change. Um, certainly one of the key pieces of advice I can provide is read the contract. Um, no matter if you're a, a quantity surveyor or a planner or engineer, I think it's important that people understand the contract and understand the baseline. What have you signed up to do? What have you signed up to uh, produce? And indeed, what is the what is the baseline position, or what is the the, the requirement, and um, to to do once things change? Um, one tip I have is that if if you're involved in a contract, it's maybe a bit um, perhaps extreme to expect every everybody who's um, in a kind of project function is going to read the entire contract, but perhaps one thing the QS could do is um, maybe do a one pager for it for, for each discipline. So, for example, you know, if it's a, a scoping part of the contract, just do a one pager on what the key parts of the scope are. Also, identify what the key things are in terms of um, notifications, early warnings, perhaps who the person is you communicate with. So, I, I, I would say uh, get that written down and get that. And briefed out to you, to your team. Um, when when you identify changes occurred, um, there's obviously different ways under different contracts of doing that, but changes are going to happen. Make sure you make sure, as I said, you you, you understand you understand what the contract requires you do. Get it written down. It's not a it's not a contention. It shouldn't be considered a contention to identify what those changes are. Get it down in writing. Get it notified, and talk to the other party about it. Don't don't hide change because ultimately, whether you're a contractor, whether you're a subcontractor, or whether you're an employer, if it's if it's slightly bad news, it needs to be discussed. But potentially, there might be ways of mitigating it. So get it written down, get it identified, and, and start discussing it. And I think then that provides that baseline to start um, monitoring it. So monitor uh, further change from drawings or progress updates, etc., or perhaps what the impact and, and costs have been. So this is just a simple, very very simple um, analogy in terms of how scope may differ and from, from different disciplines. So <clears throat> this is what the client has identified or, or may have scoped as, a, as an outline. And then this is what the architects produced. Something does does probably the same function but a slightly different specification. And then this is what the contractors installed. So three different three different things um, the client outlined what he wanted. The architect designed something slightly different, and the contractors obviously produced a, a defective out, output. Um, so, so this is how it can it can go wrong quite simply. Um, communications um, is something really important in, in terms of claims and variations. This is. Um, 
it's something that you need to do. Communication is, is imperative in terms of recovering um, what you're entitled to, whether that's cost or time. Um, and equally, communication is important in defending your position. I think it doesn't have to be a, a, a game of letter tennis or email tennis, but certainly I think if there's a mechanism for, for communicating, I think um, people in our industry need to need to improve that. Like I said, variations in claims don't always have to be contentious. All you have to do is identify, we have an issue, we have a change. This is the potential impact of that change. Let's discuss it. Let's meet up and uh, talk about how we can how, how we can uh, resolve it, perhaps, how we can mitigate it. Because I can assure you, looking at things a year or two down the line in terms of cost and time, it never produces the most accurate result, especially if you're looking at um, records which are potentially weak. So make sure, make sure your communication is a matter of fact, concise, non-emotive, and an actual record of the events. And equally, I think that's important when you're going through um, meetings, whether that's a progress meeting or whether that's a, you know now under a kind of Zoom or Teams meeting. Just make sure that um, things are certainly important. Conversations are, are minuted and communicated back, because um, you never know. There's there's always a, a point in time when you want to go back and. Um, identify what was said and what was done, and what what did you discuss in terms of that mitigation? Um, and finally, um, be professional in what you communicate. There was the, the kind of infamous case of Walter Lilly and Mackay, where I think in case law there was a number of different things discussed. Um, but but one of the one of the key takeaways in terms of communication was um, Mr. Mackay got quite a bad press in terms of how he communicated with architects and, and, and the other party, where quite frankly his language was quite um, cutting. And ultimately, whether Mr. Mackay was right or wrong in, in what he was saying, that when when he was faced with litigation. The judge didn't really want to trust what, what Mackay was saying. Um, I've also been personally involved in a case where uh, disclosure of documents meant that the other party could um, essentially download emails and look at conversations, etc. And a lot of kind of unprofessional things came out. So I think if you're in a work capacity, um, probably just generally and equally when you're community communicating with clients and subcontractors. Keep it professional, keep it concise. Um, there's no need for, for people to become overly emotive. Um, I won't go through this in, in fine detail. I thought this would be quite a, quite a decent guide uh, for people working in, in different contracts. One of the, one of the key things, if you if you look at the starting point, is that whether you're looking at any CC or four, FEDIC or JCT, um, all of the key contract requirements requires something to be, be put put forward in writing. So clause thirteen in NEC writing is the language of the is in the language of the contract. Form should be read, copied and recorded. Same with FIDIC, Clause 1.2. Anything that considers agree or agreement also requires to be submitted in writing. And finally, JCT, no surprise there, should all be in writing. So regardless of the contract, um, you should always present notifications in writing. Probably one of the, the slight differences would be um, I've seen some NEC contracts where we, we go up a gear in, in terms of early warnings. I've seen early warnings can be submitted as potentially a phone call first, where naturally you would have to follow up the phone call in writing, but 
Um, if you've got a utilities contract, for example, where you can't always put things in writing before you repair a, a burst water main, for example, sometimes a phone call is the only mechanism to get something agreed or indeed discuss a mitigation. So, so look out for that. Um, writing is, is, is in principle, um, the most important thing to think about. And then in terms of how we communicate the follow up to that, what, what is the, how do we communicate the change? So NEC under clause 61 looks at notification of compensation events. So that is the point in time where um, the contractor or the subcontractor notifies that it's no longer a, an early warning, it's no longer a risk, it's a, an actual event which is likely to create additional costs or additional time. Um, similarly, uh, FIDIC in principle has a, a very similar uh, feel, so it's not a compensation event, it's a notice of claim. So clause 20 again uh, provides uh, an outline of how you notify that claim um, which, which gives you a time limit of 28 days normally. And then JCT, which quite a lot of people are more familiar with, um, that, that's, that's also um, in, in the form of a, a notification in writing. Um, so I'll leave, I'll leave that out there for everybody to have a look at and if, if people want a copy, uh, they can use that, but, but fundamentally communication is key to the success of claims. Um, obviously that communication, whether, whether contract you're working in should be in writing. And then um, further on, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Paul, who's going to talk about how we recall certain things in, in claims. So Paul, I'll let you discuss uh, records. Thank you, Andrew. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, first of all, um, and to build upon what uh, Suzanne said initially. Um, my name is Paul Ives. I've been with HKA and its previous guises for around about 14 years, and I predominantly deal with construction claims, disputes, and uh, represent parties in adjudication. So the issues that we're talking about today, I'm continually dealing with on a on a day-to-day -day basis, and therefore, if if, if anybody does have any questions, and similar to, as Andrew said, um, please feel free to get in touch either by email. I think my phone number's on one of these slides. So if you want to give me a call and bounce something off me, I'll get a little bit of advice then feel free to get in touch. Okay, so records, um, a particular favorite um, subject of mine. And anybody who has been to me for advice in the past will know it's one of the first questions. What uh, information do you have? What records do you have? And the reason for that is if it isn't written down, then it didn't happen. Or as my old boss used to say to me when I was working as a QS many moons ago, um, if it can't be read, then it's never been said. Obviously, both very cynical statements, but in the context of construction claims and getting paid, they're often very true. And that's because records provide um, the memory of the project and records the foundation upon which all proposals, applications, disputes and claims are built and therefore without adequate records it really is difficult to build a persuasive case. And the time to be thinking about records isn't when an event happens or as and when you get on site, it really needs to be a proactive, structured, company-wide approach to records so that everybody fully understands what records are needed, how they're going to be kept, and in what format they're going to be submitted. So, you know, the number of times I've sat with clients, and you can, you can see that there's, there's, there's evidently uh, some sort of delay or disruption or, or other form of claim. But without any records, it's, it's almost impossible to, to build a claim um, that's going to be successful. So, in terms of the records, um, there are essentially four principles that we need to be thinking about when, when, when keeping records. Um, first of all, records need to be contemporaneous. Records that are prepared uh, and recorded at the time events occur hold much more credibility and weight than those which are produced after the event. Obviously, retrospective records are subjective, often 
people's hindsight comes into, into play, and people's opinions change, and therefore they're a lot less credible. Also, you've got to think about the fact that people come and go on construction projects. So it's important to get the facts and the records down in, a, in the correct format as and when the events occur. Secondly, um, are the records first hand? And by that, I mean that records should be kept by the person who is experiencing the issues that they are actually recording. So for example, there's no point having your QS who sat in the head office 100 miles away from site, keeping the site diaries. If he's getting the information related to him from the contracts manager who's getting it from the site manager, the person on site, the site manager needs to be recording those records to make sure that the first hand and therefore adding much more credibility and weight to the record that's being produced. Can you get your records approved? Um, you know, if you've got a day worksheet or a site diary or whatever it may be, if you can get a signature or approval from the other party, then it's going to be a lot more credible and hold a lot more weight. I know that's not always simple, um, and a lot of parties don't like approving records. And if that's the case, I would always suggest submitting them. You know, put the ball in, in the other party's court, submit your records and ask for a response if they disagree with anything that's contained within your records. Therefore, you've got to a structured um, submission which, which, which can be pulled out and, and used if and when those records need to be called upon. And then lastly, you've got to think about the neutrality of your records. Um, records need to record and depict both sides of um, the argument almost. Don't just record everything that's favourable to yourselves. Obviously, if you need to rely upon those records at some point going forward um, and the other party can prove that there were other issues which you've not recorded, which are detrimental to your company, that will affect the credibility of the records that you've kept. So make sure that your records are neutral. So in terms of the types of records, I always like to think of these in, in, in two very distinct categories. First of all, day-to-day -day records, and then secondly, event-specific records. Day-to-day -day records are essentially the type of records that we need to be keeping on every single construction project. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do is keep a record of everything that happens and occurs, therefore putting you in a good position should you need to recall any of this information as and when claims are required. Um, that can include, as there on the screen, site diaries, allocation sheets, time sheets, day work sheets, through to schedules of drawings, changes, meeting minutes, um, as built program. Uh, I'd always advise as built programs are built up contemporaneously as you're going through your project. Don't wait until the end, um, as and when you get into a claim situation. Um, it's much quicker and much more cost effective if you do that as you're going along. Um, progress photographs, probably one of the most underused, but um, the most influential records that can be kept, not only in terms of uh, assisting your other records, you know, um, photographs can be a great record to um, substantiate weekly progress reports and as built programs, but also as a standalone record. Um, this photograph here is a is a great example and one that I actually used within um, an adjudication about six months ago. Um, I was representing the subcontractor. The main contractor was um, trying to deduct liquidated damages um, for, for um, non-completion. Now, the adjudication was actually occurring, I think it was about 18 months after the completion of the project. And therefore, the records were great um, and people had come and gone from the project, but the main contractor had managed to put together quite a persuasive case um, and, and, and show that the subcontractor was culpable for delay. Now, the subcontractor hadn't kept great records, but what he had done was he had submitted um, photographs on a regular basis to the site manager. Now, the subcontractor was actually responsible for the groundworks, and one of his last activities was the into the perimeter of the building. Um, now, this photograph was actually taken, I think it was six weeks after the subcontract completion date. So when that was, this was put into the context of our response um, and the fact that the subcontractor could obviously you know, by no means complete his subcontract obligations because the building or this element of the building was incomplete, the scaffolding was still up and there was no, no way he could um, lay the pavings around the building. And the adjudicator found in his favour on that point. Um, so it just goes to show photographs can be a great record, especially when they are taken on site using a date recording camera and then submitted uh, as, a, as an accurate record of progress on site. 
Uh, then we've got event-specific records. Now, obviously, event-specific records are very particular to the type of contract that you're going to be working under. So as Andrew kept on mentioning, it's very important that you understand and review your contractual obligations under your contract. Understand what you need to do and what records need to be kept as and when event happens. So, for example, under a JCT form of contract, you may keep different records to substantiate um, a relevant event or a relevant matter than what you would under an NEC to try and substantiate a um, compensation event, for example. But, it, but So it's very important you understand exactly what documents are required and you set those processes in place at the beginning of the project to enable you to react as and when events occur. Um, when the event does occur, I'd often say, you know, use the, the type and format of records that you're using for your day-to-day -day records. But use them to, to record exactly what's happening for each specific event. Um, follow the principles that we talked about earlier, contemporaneous, first-hand, approved, and neutral, if possible. And then think about the actual impact of these specific issues and get it recorded. You know, if, you, if your labour has been redeployed, what are the reasons for that re redeployment? Make sure you get your notice in, as Andrew mentioned, but then list down um, those reasons. What was the progress at the point of redeployment? Can that be recorded in your documents? Can you take photographs? What men and equipment are affected by the event that's occurred? Again, get it recorded. The demobilisation time, the move time, the remobilisation, the record of the status of the new work phase that you're going to have to move on to, take photographs, and then pull all that together into an event-specific record and submit it. Very important that that is submitted at the time the event occurs or as soon as you can pull together the information required. And then continue submitting that just because uh, an event has, 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 has passed, the effects of that often continue occurring. So it's important that you monitor that and continue submitting those records uh, in accordance with the contract. So just to recap then on records, it's very important to keep detailed day-to-day -day contemporaneous records of everything that happens on site. Get them agreed and signed if possible. Submit them if applicable. Be ready to react and produce detailed event-specific records and always be aware of your contractual obligations with regards to records. Okay, so once you've, you're in a position, you've got good records um, and you need to start pulling together your claims, how do we present a robust claim? Um, well, first of all, there are a number of principles that I, that I would suggest always need to be kept at the forefront of your mind. And first and foremost, as I've said a few times already, I probably will keep on saying, what does your contract say? A claim under a JCT form of contract is going to be very different to a claim under an NEC form or a FIDIC form. Um, so you need to understand what your contractual obligations are um, and understand how your contract expects you to put your claim together. And the, the contract is, in most instances, a great guide and provides the rule book for producing your claim. So use it and use it to your advantage. Secondly, um, clarity in communication is paramount. A claim should be clear, concise, complete and correct so that the uniform reader can understand the issues and be persuaded of the validity of the claim without recourse to any other persons or documents. Now that sounds simple. But so many people fall at this hurdle. Um, you know, you, you, there's no point um, putting together a claim if you do not fully understand what it is that you're trying to portray, and then you, you, know, you can communicate that in a clear and concise manner. There's no point assuming that the other party um, will take account of documents that have been submitted previously or records that you've maybe um, issued six months ago. It all needs to be pulled together in a complete and concise document that makes sense. Um, he who asserts must prove. Um, the burden of proof always lies with the party asserting a proposition, not the party defending or denying it. So to satisfy the burden of proof, the party asserting must prove the alleged fact to the standard required by the applicable standard of proof. And standard of proof in the context of construction claims um, is on the balance of probabilities. Um, so as the snippet says there from Denning, if the evidence is such that the tribunal can say, we think it more probable than not, the burden is discharged, but if the probabilities are equal, it is not. So don't leave anything to chance. Again, you cannot assume that the other party uh, will be willing to act reasonably 
or, or will assist you in making your claim. In fact, you've got to assume the opposite. Make sure that you set out the claim, prove the cause and the effect, and pull it together, as we've said, in a clear and concise manner. Um, and the further general principles um, with regard to claims, always recognise claims early. There's no point waiting till the end of the project and then throwing all your claims in um, towards the end. Um, that is just going to promote dispute. You know, if, if claims are much more likely to be settled and accepted if they are submitted at the time they occur. For example, under a JCT contract, if you have a delay to the starting date, um, which leads to um, an ability to claim an extension of time, then submit your extension of time request. Submit your loss and expense claim in accordance with the relevant matters as and when that, that occurs. Essentially, you should be in a position to get that agreed and get paid your loss and expense within your applications going forward. You don't have to wait till the end of the project and submit it then. Get it in as soon as it happens and get paid for it. Um, I would always avoid exaggerated claims. Um, I know there's always a temptation to throw the kitchen sink into uh, for negotiation purposes, but I always find that that, um, that often leads to dispute because you're not being realistic in terms of what it is that you're claiming. Um, I find it much more advantageous to, to set your claim out based upon the entitlement and a, and a, and a true an accurate assessment of what it's worth, and then you're in a much better position to negotiate that through to settlement. Exaggerated claims often leads to dispute. Um, and then, like I've said previously, be clear on exactly what is being claimed. Um, there is, you know, you can't just bundle together a lot of information and throw it at the other party and expect them to pick the bones out and make a payment based upon on, on, on a bundle of information. You've got to be very clear and concise. If you don't understand what you're claiming, then there's no chance that the other party is going to understand what you're claiming. So be very clear in terms of what it is that you're claiming. Um, and then in terms of the, the claim document itself, um, again, depending upon the type of contract um, and the type of claim uh, that is being made, the claim document will differ. Um, so, so you need to understand exactly you know, how and on what basis you're going to set your claim up. But notwithstanding that, and in, you know, in general, I'd always keep these, these five point stages in your mind uh, to tick off as you're going through your claim submission uh, to make sure that you're putting it forward in a structured and clear um, presentation. So first of all, in terms of the introduction, um, I'd always include the names of the parties and consultants, um, a brief description of the works, the conditions of contract that you're working under, the relevant appendix entries, and a brief background of the issues in dispute. Essentially, you're setting the scene. Then the actual basis of the claim. Um, under this, um, it'll be a matter of scheduling out the clauses under which the entitlement is sought. You know, you need to be very clear in terms of what gives you the contractual entitlement to claim exactly what you were claiming. So get those clauses in there um, and state those within, within your claim. Include any implied terms that may be relied upon. If you are relying upon the Construction Act or possibly the Scheme for Construction Contracts, then get that in there. Clarify which clauses, which sections of those statutory um, implied provisions you are relying upon and make it clear. If there are any common law provisions that you're relying on, list those and get those in there. And then an expl explanation of the basis of the claim. Set out exactly what your contractual entitlement is. And then the detailed particulars. This is the meat of the claim, essentially. Um, and this needs to include the full details of every matter which is the subject of the claim. The issues need to be separated in a logical format. And there needs to be a very detailed narrative which sets out the events, dates, causes, effects with clear relevance to the documents that are included. Now, for me, the narrative is often the most important element of um, any claim submission. Um, and whilst, you know, um, programmes or uh, delay analysis or other forms of, of substantiation may be used, it's very important that a narrative is included to explain exactly what it is that you're trying to prove. A programme on its own, especially when it's presented to a third party uh, who knows nothing about the project, will often not mean anything in isolation. So the narrative needs to explain exactly what it is that you're trying to claim and get that across to the party who's reading it. Supplement the narratives with clear analysis, like we've said, in terms of delay analysis or programme analysis or whatever it may be. Schedule out the demonstrable information in a clear and concise format and then distinguish between the types of claim, if applicable, within the claim submission. 
Uh, and the next would be the evaluation. Now, um, with regard to um, any claims that are uh, being put forward, it's important that the evaluation breaks down that claim then into delay, loss, um, extension of time, loss and expense, disruption, then any other heads of claim that you may have, such as interest, head office overhead, subcontract costs, fluctuations, finance. Um, you might need to make sure that you provide all the information to support the evaluation of your claim. So if it, if it is a monetary claim, then make sure that you include uh, the substantiation to prove your costs. Again, the, a lot of claims that come across my desk, people spend a lot of time presenting and promoting and proving their entitlement. And then they kind of just say, and therefore yours, £100,000 million pounds, whatever the claim may be, without having any focus on the actual quantum element of the claim as well. So don't fall at that last hurdle. Get together your analysis, but also prove your quantum. And that may differ under which, you know, under the different types of co contract that we're talking about. If it's defined cost, the impact upon defined cost under NEC, or um, the impact upon the, the accepted programme under NEC, or actual cost if it's a relevant matter under JCT. So make sure you understand your contracts and obligations, but make sure you can also substantiate your quantum. Then lastly, the statement, um, which will generally be uh, a summary of your claim and um, just a, 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 a depiction of exactly what you were claiming. So just to put the recap on um, the presentation of claims. Robust claims need to follow the contract, understand your contractual obligations, first and foremost, very imp important. Be clear, concise, complete and correct in terms of the submission. Remember, who asserts must prove on the balance of probabilities. Don't leave anything to chance. Make sure that you clearly determine cause and effect. Recognise claims early. Avoid exaggerated claims. Be clear on exactly what, what is being claimed and why. And then set it out in a very structured format. Okay, so once you've got your records, you're in a position where you can produce a claim. Um, what if it fails? What if you, you cannot get agreement? What then? Well, as I keep on saying, first and foremost, what does your contract say? Um, almost all construction contracts, especially standard forms, will include dispute resolution provisions. So understand what those are within the contract. For example, the NEC4 includes three options. Option W1, um, which is contractual adjudication, option W2, which is statutory adjudication, and option W3, um, which is a, a new provision, which includes the ability to appoint a dispute avoidance board. Um, but in terms of W1 and W3, there is a procedure within each of those which states that senior representatives from the parties must meet and must um, try to resolve the dispute before it goes on to adjudication or the DAB. So it's important that you understand um, those procedures and you understand what your contract says in terms of dispute. So once you understand your, your contractual obligations, um, and generally speaking, um, what are your options in terms of taking a, a claim to the next level? Well, court litigation is always an option, uh, but as we all know, that can often be um, a very expensive and, and time-consuming option. So there are a number of alternative dispute uh, resolution processes which can be considered. And to quickly have a look at a few of these, um, first of all, there is arbitration, um, which is, like I say, an alternative to lit litigation in which the parties refer the dispute to the party, uh, the arbitrator. Now, in comparison to court, it can sometimes be quicker. It can sometimes be more cost effective. It's often more flexible than court proceedings. Um, but in comparison to other uh, alternative dispute um, resolution proceedings, it is often seen to be very time consuming and very expensive. And therefore, in the UK, um, there's not much, or we don't see much in terms of domestic arbitrations these days. Uh, a lot in terms of international arbitrations, but not in terms of the domestic UK market. But it's still there and it's still an option uh, and can be used. Mediation um, is another option. Um, Mediator would be an independent person who would facilitate discussions between the parties with the aim of resolving the dispute. Um, the companies would, of, would all, often agree on that mediator or, or, or someone could possibly be named within the contract. Um, 
parties make submissions to the mediator um, and the mediator tries to lead the parties to uh, common ground and facilitate a settlement. Now, mediation is promoted within the pre-action pro protocol as an early step prior to litigation, therefore it does have the backing of the courts uh, and can be a, a very uh, useful um, tool in resolving disputes. However, the main disadvantage is that there is no um, um, you know, there's no contractual or, or, or required um, need for the parties to agree. So you could go through the process of making your submissions, having the meeting, but if one party or both parties decide that they don't like the settlement that, that, that is being reached, then they can walk away. And therefore the costs and the time that are spent um, towards the mediation are effectively lost. So there needs to be two very mo motivated parties. And if you do have two motivated parties, then mediation can be a very a very good tool. Uh, expert determination, um, again, um, a more informal process um, in which an expert is appointed to decide on a dispute. Again, that can be included within the contract or, or just entered into between the parties. It can be very quick and cost effective. Um, however, it doesn't have any statutory backup and therefore it's much less tied to legal proceedings. And if you do have an issue with the proceedings or if you do want to challenge the decision that's made at the end, then it can therefore become difficult, um, which, which does put parties off. Um, but it can be useful too, again, and it's subject to the actual circumstances of a particular dispute. And then lastly, uh, adjudication. Um, now, adjudication is the most used form of ADR within the UK, and that's primarily based upon the fact that um, every construction contract has the ability to, to issue a dispute to adjudication at any point in time, assuming that you, you fall within the parameters of the Construction Act. Um, now, it is something, as I mentioned before, that I'm involved with um, quite a lot, and I really do think it is a good um, form of, of resolving disputes. It's relatively quick, 28-day process, uh, which can be extended, but not, you know, often not by much. Um, it is relatively cost-effective, with both sides generally um, being responsible for their own representation costs uh, and with the adjudicator deciding his actual fees. And in, and in most cases, both parties accept the, the adjudicator's decision uh, and move on um, because adjudication is only temporarily binding until being enforced by the courts. But I do find in 95% of, of, of adjudication that the parties accept that decision and move on, which is very good. Um, also, um, more recently, the RICS and the CIC has introduced um, what they call low value disputes, which is an attempt to try and open up um, adjudication to disputes of maybe under 100 grand or under 50,000 pounds, where the process is slightly uh, simplified and um, the adjudicator's key, uh, fees are often capped, and therefore making it more available to parties who, 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 who maybe would be put off under, under normal circumstances. Um, so adjudication can be used and it can also be used as a very good tool to, to promote um, negotiation as well. Okay, so um, well that concludes my slides. Um, so as we said at the beginning, more than happy to take any questions. Um, myself and Andrew can actually see if any questions have been um, written out as we have been talking away. Um, I've just opened up the document. So if there are any questions, please type them in the in the in the comment box and we'll try our best to answer them. I'll take I'll take the first one there, Paul, from um, uh, Daniel Pang. So Daniel's asking the question of um, please advise what documents are acceptable and should be submitted from the contractor to the employer to substantiate actual loss and or expense incurred, such as prolongation costs. So I think the, the answer to that, uh, Daniel, I think very much depends on whatever contract you're working on. So, um, for example, if you're working on a, an NEC contract, for example, um, you may, on a um, certainly one of the reimbursable options. Um, no, it's, you're saying JCT. 
Yeah, so so on, on an NEC contract, you'd certainly be required to provide um, actual cost data. Um, for the JCT contract, you could probably um, get away with, with presenting a little bit less in terms of actual data. But as Paul suggested in his um, part of the presentation, I think the more detail you have, the better. So if you have actual cost records, so you might have, for example, if you are looking at people costs, for example, I would always say it would be prudent to um, detail timesheets. So timesheets which would be signed by uh, the employer, for example. Equally, you would look, look for uh, costs um, which, which would um, attribute to those timesheet entries. So you'd be looking to provide as much detail as you can. Um, and obviously, without um, prejudicing someone's um, personal contract details, for example, you can always you can always pull out um, timesheets and costs, which I think would go a long way to demonstrating what your actual loss is were. So I hope, hope that helps, uh, uh, Daniel. Okay, um, thanks, Andrew. I'll take another question. Um, it? Nicholas Charles just popped up there. As a contractor working predominantly under JCT, who would you suggest produce the records, and would this be a standalone role? Um, no, not. I, I certainly wouldn't suggest it be a standalone standalone role. Um, I think you know applying those principles that we spoke about before in terms of the, the documents and records being first hand. Um, I think it very much depends upon the record that's being produced. You know, so if you are producing um site diaries and um, records of exactly what is happening on site then that needs to be a person who's experiencing that and i gen you know generally find that that would be your site manager your contracts manager uh, your site supervisors or whoever is you know is generally keeping um tabs on, on on the labor and the events that are occurring on site um in terms of Records, you know, maybe maybe day worksheets or maybe in terms of loss and expense and costs that may be quantity surveyor. Um, and <coughs> therefore, it depends upon the role and the nature of the actual records themselves. I, I would all, always, you know, try and look at splitting the, the the role at the beginning of the project. You know, don't wait until the events occur and then and then you know panic in terms of who who's going to be doing what. Set out those roles and responsibilities at the beginning of the project so everybody knows exactly. What they're going to be doing, if and when, and you know what records they will be keeping in what format, uh, and then everybody's very clear in terms of what role they have in terms of those records. So I hope that helps. Um, quite an interesting one there from uh, Tom Beverly. So Tom suggesting or asking the question, how do you assess loss of productivity when there was never a normal situation? So, for example, work starting in site during uh, disruption caused by changes in law and or force majeure. Um, I think to, to address that question, um, I think the default position would be um, you would have to try and demonstrate uh, what what would be what would be reasonable in terms of productivity. So, if you priced up um, a job, which obviously, well, potentially you've priced that job up pre-COVID-19, you're going to assume that production levels are going to be of a, of a certain uh, certain level. For example, take a traditional brick brickwork um, activity. You would perhaps say that, you know, a brick worker is going to do X metres of brick work in a day, and that's going to generate um, your norms for pricing and equally what your durations for program activities. So what you'd have to do is demonstrate that that was your baseline, which is potentially a bit more subjective, because obviously you won't have the, the beauty of relying on actual progress. But I think if you can't demonstrate actual progress because of you know you've started the project in, a, in an uncertain period. Then your default position would be well, what would be reasonable? So whether it's brickwork or joinery or um, cabling or, or steelwork, for example, you'll find that um, on the web or, or different resources have 
uh, kind of common norms for, for certain outputs. Um, and I know people like myself and Paul are a bit more geeky that way. We probably retain um, some of these norms. So if you're ever struggling, um, give us a shout. Okay, another one here from, from Carlos. Um, what is your view on proceeding with instructions in cases where there is no prior agreement on cost? Should contractors proceed with instructions regardless? And how is best to protect risk of non-payment? Well, yeah, um, Carlos, under, certainly under all um, standard forms of contract, you have an obligation to proceed with instructions, notwithstanding agreement on cost. Um, so if you... You know, there's there's no uh, contractual right um, for you to, you know, not continue with a with an instruct or an instruction or instructed works on the basis of not getting your costs agreed. Otherwise, you'll be in breach of contract. Um, even under JC, uh, sorry, NEC forms, which is very you know a very prescriptive form of, of contract, there is still the ability for the um, project manager or the contractor or the employer, whoever it may be, to instruct you to to carry on with the works. And then to retrospectively value um, cost afterwards. And obviously, that can often put the contractor in a, you know, a less advantageous position, let's say. Um, but that's where the record keeping comes into play. That's where getting your records and getting your assessment of what you, you believe to be your contractual entitlement in relation to that instruction on the table as soon as possible and putting it in a clear and concise format so that you don't really give the the instructing party um, any excuses in terms of then valuing what your true entitlement is under the contract. Um, ultimately, um, if obviously if you if, if you are instructed to do the works and you must proceed with them and you can't agree on cost, then you're into a claims dispute type situation as we've been talking about today. Um, I'll pick one from uh, Dave King's put a couple through. Um, so, so to answer your first one, David. Do you agree that a change during construction contract should be avoided where possible? So, i.e., make the change after the contract is complete, even in some cases that involves excluding an area or element from the contract. Well, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the best solution, uh, David. I think, um, naturally, um, certainly my experience doing this for quite some time, that things do change. Um, so, so be that, um, you know, the employer circumstances may change, design circumstances may change, or, or indeed uh, budgets may change. So things naturally in construction change. I think we are all engaged somewhat in the process to manage it, manage the change, and obviously um, negate the impacts as much as we possibly can. So I think I think wherever there's wherever there's change, um, I wouldn't say necessarily leaving that to, to the end of a job or excluding the area of change would, would make much of a, an impact. So I think dealing with the change head on, looking at ways of mitigating or value engineering is perhaps the most economical solution. I think if we waited till the end of the project, um, Potentially, uh, it may be co more costly to to go back and correct that that item. Um, so, so I hope that hope that assists. Okay, um, I was just reading one then. I lost it. <laughs> there we are from Jack Finney. Does the burden of proof shift to the project manager if he decides to do a PM assessment on an NEC three CE? If he disagrees with the contractor's quotation, well, like, essentially yes. Uh, I mean, if the project manager is producing his own assessment um, and he um, uh, provides that in accordance with the contract, then essentially he he must be in a position to uh, prove that assessment. If you disagree with that assessment, then you're in a position where you, you know you're in you're in a claim situation, and therefore both parties must. Um, Prove their own assessment of that compensation event. Um, so, yeah, it, it, depending on who is putting forward um, the assertion, especially under an NEC, where, is it, where it is the project manager making an assessment, yeah, he, he takes on that burden of proof if, if, it, if he is um, saying that that is assessment, his assessment of that compensation event. And if you want to challenge that, then obviously the burden of proof is on you to prove 
why that is incorrect and why your assessment is correct. So it can shift depending on obviously who, who is putting forward the, the, the assertion at, at any point in time. Um, there's actually quite a few um, COVID-19 related questions which are uh, touching on delays and, and, and what happens. Um, Darren Hurst and um, Diana Hodg Hodgkinson have, have sent a couple of things in. So addressing COVID-19, um, so the first part of that que the question was um, if the project's delayed due to COVID-19 restrictions and now spans beyond the Christmas period, would the NEC or JCT expect you to work normally during that shutdown period? Um, I think, as we spoke about in our seminar, I think the most important thing is that you're going to immediately um, after this uh, seminar, you're going to send an early warning in to your employer or, or client, it's NEC4. Um, and I think what you want to do is um, have the discussion early. So there's no point waiting until uh, the 20th of December and then deciding you, you have to work it or not. I think I think the most important thing is to communicate um, a solution. So what's reasonable in the circumstances? Is it reasonable because uh, COVID-19 has happened that everybody is going to work a 12-hour shift for the, for the next year? I, I don't think that's entirely reasonable. I think going back to uh, whether it's JCT or um, NEC contracts, what you're expected to do is uh, essentially is reasonable endeavours. So what is the what is the reasonable um, progress that you should be displaying as a, as a competent contractor or competent subcontractor? It doesn't mean to say that you work indefinitely. It doesn't mean to say that you work statutory uh, holidays, for example. It could be that if your business is prepared to do that and the client or employer is prepared to pay for that, then that might be a solution. But I think the most important thing is have the conversation. Um, and, and if it does happen, make sure you, you, you cover you cover that in, in records. There's a couple okay. more people in there. Yeah, there's um, one here from uh, Mustafa. Uh, what do you think about the application of LDs in the presence of non-assessment for the contractor's claims or total rejection. Um, so I'm assuming, under your example, Mustafa, you, you'd be talking about the, the, the you know, the, the fact that the, um, the contractor or the subcontractor is late, and therefore the employer has taken um, liquidated damages for non-completion. In that circ in those circumstances, the onus is very much upon the contractor to prove the fact that he is not culpable for those delays. Under the, the contract, the employer um, has the right to deduct LDs as soon as um, that completion date is missed. And the onus, like I say, is on the contractor to prove um, that, that, um, that they are not culpable for the delay. So if you've put a claim in, um, which is for delay, an extension of time possibly, then it's very much a matter of establishing that claim to uh, deflect the ability of the client to take, or the employer to take liquidated damages. Um, so if, from what you're saying, if, if that employer has not assessed your claim or has rejected it, which I suppose can be two different scenarios really, if it's just been rejected, then essentially you've, you've got a claim situation where you need to either look at your claim and, and decide whether it's good enough to challenge the LAD uh, deduction, or on the other side, if, if the employer is simply is not assessing your claim, again, you're in a situation where you need to do something about that to take that to the next stage um, to ensure that the, those liquidated damages you know, cannot be taken contractually in accordance with the contracts if you have uh, an entitlement to an extension of time um, and, and to get rid of those liquidated damages. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, Philip, to answer your question on standard templates or guidance templates for record keeping, um, probably what we do as, a, as an HKA business, I think people who uh, 
those of us in our, our teams who are working directly for um, employers or contractors, yes, they probably have um, templates. Um, I don't know if we'd be openly sharing those type, types of things, but I suppose my advice is um, you, you can quite readily make these yourself. I think um, as a starting point, any 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 site needs a, a site diary. Um, so you need to record who's on site at any given time. So in the lack of maybe a biometric system, you might want to have a, a check-in and check-out uh, register. So who's been on site, how long have they been on site, and what is their, their job? Um, sometimes in claims, Paul and I may be presented with a, a sheet of diaries, and, it, and it's a bunch of, bunch of scribbles. So we need to know who the people are, what the job function is, when they started, when they finished, and, and equally identify what they were doing. It also assists if um, you take photographs, as Paul uh, also showed in his presentation. So, so it's, it's maybe also good practice to um, take a run around site every morning or, or every evening um, and record what's happening. Just take pictures of some of the key parts of work, show, show the progress, so that if you ever need to look back and think, you, you've got a you've got um, a record of that. Um, and then I think Stefan, in the same vein, has asked for um, specifically for a COVID nineteen delay. What would you expect to see in terms of contemporary records uh, substantiating unavailability of labour? Um, it's quite difficult to substantiate who's unavailable, I suppose. But certainly, um, I think what you'd have to do in that instance, so you might have to um, demonstrate who was on the project perhaps prior to COVID-19. And then you'd probably have to demonstrate um, perhaps who was furloughed, who wasn't furloughed, and then generate a, a list of people who were perhaps unavailable. Um, I think anything anything in writing or spreadsheet that, that records that, the better. So, uh, what about you, Paul? There's a couple more in. Yeah, a couple more there. One from uh, Ross K. Um, he mentioned the low value dispute adjudication as an option. Does that need to be expressed as an option in the ADR provisions of the contract, or is it deemed part of the scheme as an option? Well, the scheme provides. Um, and the Construction Act provides the ability to, to refer a matter to uh, adjudication at any time. Um, the low value disputes option um, is at, the, at present all still very new and still quite untested, but it dep is dependent upon the nominating body essentially. So the RICS has the option of low value dis disputes. I know the CIC has a model procedure um, for low value disputes. So essentially, it, it could depend upon. Um, who the nominating body is within your contract. Certainly, if it's the RICS, then there is the option there to refer it to adjudication through the RICS and take advantage of the uh, low value dispute um, track, if you like. Um, so, yeah, so I think in, in, in the first instance, and, and you know, as this low value dispute um, gains action and, and more of the nominating bodies um, you know, develop it. And, and we see some of them coming through the system, I think it will be more prevalent. But as it, as it stands at the moment, the likes of the RICS and, and, and the larger nominating bodies will have a uh, facility to, to, you know, to, to take these low value disputes and, and enable you to notify an adjudication through the low value dispute model. Um, finally, we've got a question from Daniel, I think another one. So under a JCT contract, are contractors entitled to claim disruption? or loss of productivity if they refuse to work extended site hours up to say nine o'clock. Um, I think it's back to back to again what we discussed, um, Daniel. So what does the contract say? Most contracts I've seen should to de determine what the site working hours are. So usually you'll see, you know, perhaps um, you know, seven thirty or eight o'clock in the morning till five, five thirty. Which sometimes these um, times are governed by, um, you know, 
not disrupting neighbours or access restrictions, etc. So usually you go back to the contract. So what does the contract say you should be uh, geared up to do? Now, obviously, we're in circumstances where COVID has um, created a massive disruption and um, potentially um, one way of mitigating that would be working extended hours. But going back to the contract, if the contract site hours are only up to five o'clock, say, there's no reason why um, it, 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 you have to work till nine o'clock. Um, the core hours, working, working out with the core hours is mitigation. Working within the core hours is how you would look at disruption. I think if you were, you were getting an extra four hours on site, by refusing to do that, doesn't necessarily mean that you're not entitled to disruption. So hopefully that, that clears that up for you. I think that's uh, the last of the questions, If there's, unless there's any more. Okay, one just popped up from Mustafa. Uh, generally speaking, extension due to the COVID-19 related delay relies on the foreseeable event provision. If the employer issues variation for the extension of time, sorry, I lost that then. The second wave occurs. How can the contractor preserve his right as the impact of COVID would not be unforeseeable any longer? Okay, well, I mean, the unforeseeable element of the provision um, is, is, is general, well, it is in relation to when you enter into contract. Um, so when you enter into your contract, if obviously an event is unforeseeable at that point in time, then that is what the, um, the clause that you're relying on is relating to. If you know that event obviously must become foreseeable during the course of your work for it to become an event. So if there's a second wave under that same contract, under that same provision, then you've still got the same rights and entitlement you had initially for the second wave as you would do for the, for the first wave, um, assuming that you're under the same contract. Um, the problem comes in now, I think, where we're entering into new contracts now that COVID-19 is, you know, uh, known about, established, and we know it's going to cause disruption. That is obviously now not an un unforeseen event anymore, and therefore we need to be thinking about that when we're entering into contracts in the first instance. And, 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 and talking, I suppose, with the employer when you're entering into the contracts um, as to how they foresee and, and how they expect to um, manage the contract if there is a second wave or if there is uh, an issue with a pandemic. Um, and get those type issues ironed out of the doors, and there may be the need to amend your contract to, uh, you know, to to make agree make agreement or to to formalise any discussions that you do have with the employer in terms of how you will deal with pandemics um, in terms of extension of times and cost. So I'd always try and have those discussions up front in terms of contracts going forward, um, but certainly with with existing contracts that were entered into prior to. The pandemic if you do have that type of clause then then i would say that that would cover you for for the duration of your contract um just one in there from uh, john on an nec project overseas where as a contractor he's been asked to share the risk of further outbreak of covid 19. um john if i was you i'd be reaching for the the parachute cord uh, quite quickly um <laughs> don't, I don't know if I would be sharing the risk of COVID-19 because ultimately it's, uh, it's it's almost an unquantifiable risk. I mean, who's to say? Um, who's to say as a contractor how how can you possibly um, mitigate that? For example, so that naturally you're you're paid to provide a service of some sort. If you're paid to provide a service, then your risk as a contractor is to is the risk of your own workforce um, being unproductive or making a, an error. So something like COVID nineteen, for example, um, you know who knows um, what what it could do to um, procurement of we, we've already saw I think in the industry a shortage of uh, materials because pretty much everybody in furlough is putting a new decking system in their back garden. 
So, so when you look at what what would COVID part two do for for the industry, I think almost certainly we're going to have a shortage of uh, steel. We're going to have a shortage of timber and key um, materials. I don't think as a contractor you can possibly foresee uh, what the impacts would be. And equally, you can't take a, a, an unlimited hit for for what those impacts are. Um, I would say I would say those risks should lie with the person paying the bill, which are the employer. Um, ultimately, I think what you can do is, is potentially say to the employer that yes, you know you're you're willing to um, mitigate whatever you can. You'll obviously try and make use of you know if there's a you know a system such as furlough to mitigate people costs, for example. There's ways you can obviously try and mitigate, but I think taking 50% of that risk is, is probably quite significant. And one here from Jonathan Howard. Um, under a JCT management contract, the subcontractor was genuinely delayed but did not put in any notices, maybe a few emails. Is there any recourse that may, can be had after PC? Um, well, generally speaking, under a JCT form of contract, um, the, the delay provisions and the extension of time provisions are not necessarily conditioned precedent. So if you have emails, if you have got some form of records, you may have enough to retrospectively pull together um, an extension of time claim, um, which would be uh, which would, would give you entitlement under the contract. You obviously depend upon what records you've got, uh, what those emails that you do have say, essentially. Um, but yeah, under a JCT form of contract, you, you, you're not as uh, exposed as you would be maybe under an NEC form, for example. Um, what I would say is if you are after PC now, um, under the JCT contracts, um, once you start getting towards the issue of the final certificate and those type of um, of mechanisms, then you, you know you, you're into the realms of, of a final and conclusive um, assessment from the contract administrator or the employer, and therefore you know you need to be getting your claim together in whatever format it is pretty quickly to make sure that you don't fall foul of those final and conclusive um, final certificates, which may take away um, the ability for you to make that claim at all. Uh, but generally, like I said, generally speaking, JCT, you, you may be okay. You may be okay. You may, you may need looking at it in detail, but you may be okay. Yeah, so so thanks everybody for, for attending. Um, it, it was much much appreciated that you've taken the time to, to listen to us. Um, uh, as we've said in the seminar, we'll, we'll, we'll open out slides to, to everybody who's attended. And, um, you know, if there's any, any issues in there, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch. So um, take care, everybody. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good luck. Cheers. Thank you.